director of planning and budgeting mm -hmm. here at Dickinson. And so I thought, I think some of these people are relatively new in the department here, maybe? I just celebrated yeah. one month today. Right. <laughs> And monetary and financial things are just like little, little things that kind of started about me. So that was my idea for why to bring these lovely ladies here to talk to us about it. So thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting us. Well, good evening, everybody. How are you? Good. Doing great. Well. You know, I was feeling pretty good about coming here and doing this, um, but then I had like a rude awakening. I am your vice president for resources, so buildings people, money, and I got here and realized that the VP of buildings can't get into buildings. <laughs> <laughs> so all that power I thought I had just went completely out of the way, right? But um, we're excited to be here. Very few people ever come to the business office and ask for help or assistance. So anything that we can ever do for you, let us know. I mean, we'll gladly uh, come. Um, so we're excited to be here to talk about personal budgeting tonight um, and to share some tips that we um, both know professionally but then also personally. So Margaret and I are going to kind of tag team this thing and she'll get us started. Okay, I think you have a basic concept. Your inflows have to be greater than your outflows. Alright, sounds very simple, but you really need to first of all understand what your inflows are really understand what your outflows are. So we're going to go into each of those in more detail. So there's some very basic things to understand um, after you leave college um, and you get your first job, right? Um, one of the very first things to start thinking about is what's your tax class, right? With the salary that I make, am I going to be in the 15% tax class? Are they going to be taking 28% out of my paycheck? What tax bracket do I fit into? Um, because it's going to be important to understand what your net paycheck is going to be each month versus what your gross salary is. And some people don't, it sounds so basic, but a lot of people don't take that into consideration, right? The other thing that's really important is to understand what your, your payroll deductions are relative to your benefits, right? Because there are going to be a number of items that uh, they take out before they calculate taxes, and then there's a whole other group of things that come out after taxes. So understanding the difference between those things because they do have an impact on the net paycheck that you take home. Um, so the first thing to know or to think about um, is health insurance. I mean, everybody knows about health insurance at this point in time. Uh, but when you get your first job, uh, most companies have uh, a variety of plans. Okay, um, And if you're coming straight out of college and you don't have any real health considerations, you don't necessarily need to go for the Cadillac plan, right? They have plans that are more expensive for people with families or people that have significant um, health issues. For your first 10 years or so out of college, you need to go for the basic plan, right? Because you just need to cover your kind of maintenance issues. Um, but it's important to understand the difference between the plans that they're going to offer you. Um, the other thing to understand are the deductibles, the co-pays, and the prescription costs associated with your um, health plan. So, deductibles. That's the amount of money that you have to pay before your insurance kicks in. So, there are some plans where it requires you to pay the first $500 towards um, health care, and then your insurance kicks in after that, but it's important to know what the deductible is going to be on your health plan. Um, copay. Copay is what you have to pay when you go to the doctor before they render any services. Typically $20 could be $30, but it's important to know that when you're looking at the health plan. Um, then the other thing is with prescriptions. To know with your health plan how much your prescriptions are going to be, because a lot of us have monthly prescriptions that we have filled, so to know what that's going to cost you um, each month. Now, it's important to also note that um, a lot of plans give you some flexibility. So you have mail-in orders, or you can get 90 days worth of prescriptions 
for a cheaper price. So it's important to ask those kinds of questions up front so that you can save yourself as much money as possible. Um, retirement plans. I know just coming out of college, the last thing you're thinking about is retirement. But the reality is, the sooner you start saving, the better off you're going to be. So it's critical that you find out if your um, employer has a matching program. Meaning, oftentimes they'll say, if you contribute 2, 3, 4%, then we'll match it with another 2, 3, or sometimes 5%. If, if you possibly can afford to do it, don't blow off getting the free money or the additional contributions for your retirement. So if they have a matching program, try to build that into your equation. Because honestly, most matches are more aggressive than what you're going to put in. Um, I'm coming to Dickinson from St. John's College. Um, at St. John's, if we put in uh, 3%, they matched it with 7%. So... My 3% got me a total of 10%, so it's kind of a no-brainer. So be sure you know what kinds of retirement plans they offer, and if you can afford to do it, please do it up front, because you'd be amazed at what you can accumulate. I started saving with my very first job, and I am very happy every time I get my statement, because I'm in my early 40s, and I am in great shape for a retirement that's not coming for another 20-plus years. But that's because I started very early, okay? Uh, flexible spending accounts. This really um, is something that won't necessarily apply to you um, in your initial jobs. What this is is a way to take money out of your paycheck and set it aside for health care expenses typically, um, daycare kind of expenses, and other categories. But this is a way to kind of save money that you can use throughout the year. In your initial years, this may not be as important to you as you get older and you have children and you have additional um, expenses associated with it. Um, and then last, understanding what the cost of the additional benefits are. Uh, vision, dental, um, most companies will offer you life insurance and understanding whether you want to take out additional life insurance for the in incremental expenses. Again, uh, I know here at Dickinson with the dental plan there's kind of a Cadillac and then there's kind of a basic. I have perfect teeth, so I don't need to be in the Cadillac plan, but if I knew that I wanted to have braces or I needed to have root canal and dot, 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 then it would make sense for me to be in the Cadillac plan. Now, with vision, we don't get that option because if there was a Cadillac plan, I'd need to be in it because I've been wearing glasses since the second grade, so I'd be in that. So it's going to be based on you, but understanding what the differentials are, right? Because they're going to be taken out of every paycheck that you receive. So you want to be sure that you're not paying for benefits that you're not going to use. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so that gets you down after all the deductions that you carefully choose, once you paid out, then you have your, your salary that you're going to be bringing home. All right, let's start talking about... Let me go back one slide. The other thing to know, and you don't even have to put it back. I don't know how to do it. That's fine. The other thing to know is how you're going to be paid. Right? When I worked at St. John's, we were paid once a month. Okay? There are some places that pay on the 15th and 30th of the month, regardless as to where it falls. There are other places that pay every other Friday. So it's important also to think about when you're going to be paid when you're thinking about all the expenses that you're going to have to cover during the course of the month. Okay. All right, so now we're going to talk, start talking about money. So we go out in front of we have more slides about the stuff going out than the money coming in. That's just reality. First thing is your housing. Well, most of you probably will be renting or owning something uh, with your first job. And there's a rule of thumb out there that your monthly rent should not be more than 30% of your monthly income. And that's a pretty good, safe place to stay at that or below. Now, there are places, uh, my son has an apartment in New York City, his electric, gas, water, sewer, trash is all included in his rent. There's places that you go that none of those things are included. So you have to know when you're signing the lease what is included, what is not included. If these things are not including, included, particularly if you live in the northern climate and it's cold, you're going to spend a lot for heat. If you live in the deep south, 
and if you need air conditioning, it's not going to be included. You'll be paying a high electric bill. Yeah, I lived in Texas for 10 years. And so you basically have the air conditioning on most of the year, right? Um, it could be November and you still have the air conditioning on. So thinking about my utilities there was slightly different from living back on the East Coast where I get some months where there are breaks in that. Don't be afraid to ask the landlord what's the typical electric bill if it's not included. They should have that kind of information. What is the what's the typical water bill? What's the typical what's the trash bill? Okay. All right, self maintenance. These are the things that take care of yourself. Obviously, you're going to need food, and that's pretty probably easy to budget. You can decide how much you need a week, limit how much you eat out, and how much you you cook for yourself. Uh, your clothing. You want to set probably a monthly budget for that. Uh, you'll need clothes for your job. And then you have things like haircuts and other personal needs. You want to make sure you have enough money set aside. And again, we get back to health care. You're going to have those co-pays, those deductibles, your prescriptions. Um, we're also going to talk about if you are sick, whether you go to the emergency room versus urgent care. Go to urgent care unless you're probably really going to need to be hospitalized. Yeah, because with most insurance plans, and even with the plan we have here at Dickinson, an urgent care center might cost you $50 to go to, and a lot of emergency rooms will require you to pay $150 or $200 to be seen, mm -hmm. right? So right after you're going through where they're getting all your data and checking your, right, they will ask you for a payment there. And there's obviously a huge difference between 50 bucks and 200 bucks. And the urgent care centers, most of them are 24 hours, and they have the same doctors. And in most cases, you're going to be seen a lot quicker than if you go to the emergency room. So it's important to know that about your health care plan so that, again, you make the best decisions. Okay? So then there are other things that, um, as you're thinking about your apartments, um, or, or houses that you're going to rent that you need to think about. Um, cable, internet, and phone, right? They now some sell you the bundles, but make sure you understand what happens with that bundle. Um, I think we had a bundle, and we were not very happy with the bundle. Well, you can get internet, phone, and cable all together, right? Um, or there are a lot of companies that will offer you kind of an initial, if you sign up the first five or six months are at this rate, but then after that's over, it jumps to some rate that you didn't see coming, right? So make sure you're paying attention to the fine print with those programs um, because you can get burned, right? Um, car. Uh, this is a pretty important one. Whether you're going to finance your car, whether you're just going to buy a car, like a used car, uh, then you've got the insurance that's associated with the car, the gas, and then the maintenance of the car. So a lot of times folks will buy a new car, but they're not thinking about what it means to kind of keep the car maintained during the life of the car. Not just the oil changes, but the regular servicing and what that's going to cost you. So those are things you need to be thinking about. Um, many of you are going to be leaving with student loans. So understanding what some of your um, repayment options are. Sally Mae offers programs where in your initial years you can pay less in repayment and then it, it, it is accelerated based on your salary and your years out of college. So make sure that you ask those questions as you're starting to think about repaying your student loans. Okay? Um, travel. This is one that's pretty important. Um, I lived in Texas for 10 years. That's where I went to do my doctoral work. But I'm from Maryland. So I needed to be thinking ahead about Christmas break, Mother's Day, the days that I knew that I wanted to go home, and I knew what the average plane ticket was going to cost me. So making sure that as I got close to November, I had the 350 or so bucks it was going to cost me to fly back here for the holidays. So thinking about that. And then vacations, right? You're going to want to take trips to the beach or to wherever it is that you like to do, but you have to be thinking about those things ahead of time so that you can start saving for them um, so that you can get that in. Um, and then the last, I mean, we all want to have fun. There are things that we all like to do. Um, so you always need to be thinking about what portion of your money you want to set aside to be sure that you can have dinner with friends from time to time. Um, so these are all the things you should be thinking about as you're thinking about the net paycheck that you're going to be bringing home each month. Okay. We have some other things to talk about. Renter's insurance. If your apartment building has a fire, 
guess what? Your stuff is uncovered. Landlord insurance is for his building is not for your property. So you lose your TV, computer, all your clothing, etc. Renter's insurance tends to be very inexpensive. I just think it's something that you should consider, particularly if you have some things of value. It's also recommended that you build an emergency fund, that you set money aside, and the rule of thumb again is that you always have three to six months of your expenses, which you would understand from the budget, you may set aside an emergency fund. So if there's some reason you can't work, whether there's an illness, you or your family, um, an accident, your company downsizes. Or you right. work for the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. And you're waiting for them to allow you to go back to work, right? Right, so... The, yeah. They did what? They just passed a measure then to shut down. Woo! Yay! Yeah. 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 It doesn't have like um, many minutes, though. Yeah. Just when the update came. Yeah. But think about those people, right? They, they, were, they were hoping that wasn't going to happen. And so, for a while, they've been sitting at home, and they're not earning anything during that period of time. Yeah, a shutdown causes $3 billion in net loss in the general outputs per day. Yeah, so that is a massive amount of money that's not going to businesses. Yeah, yeah that's right. All right, so <laughs> that's why you want to have an emergency fund. <laughs> okay. All right, saving. Um, you. You need to have goals and start saving for those goals. And that is typically one of the first things people do is uh, want to buy a house. And they will need a large down payment, particularly in this credit environment. Banks want a substantial down payment. And from my own experience, I was lucky. My husband and I were transferred uh, to another location. Our housing was paid for for a year and a half. So I had no housing costs. So I put that money aside, not spend it on other stuff, I put that money aside so that when we got transferred back, we would be able to buy a house. Um, you also will be thinking about whether you want future education or certificates, uh, what that's going to cost. You will get a really high return on investment from further education. So if you want to plan for that in your budget by setting money aside. And of course, there's always philanthropy. I believe that in, as an engaged citizen from Dickinson, you will give back to the community with your time and your treasure. Yeah, but as go back to the pursuing additional education, don't be done, just here. Um, with that particular slide, thinking now about whether there are advanced degrees you want to pursue and thinking about when you might do that, right? Um, in my case, after I finished my undergraduate degree, I decided I wanted to get an MBA immediately. And so I figured my mom was already used to paying my rent, so I went home my senior year and said, this is what I want to do, right? Um, would you be willing to continue to take care of my rent for the next two years? I can handle the rest of my expenses if you will cover my rent. And so that's a deal we made, right? I always knew that I was going to do my PhD. After paying for two of my degrees, I was not going to ask my mom to help me with the third. So I had to think about when and where I was going to do that. In my case, being the finance person that I am, I wanted my, my PhD from a top 10 school, um, but I wanted it from the cheapest top 10 school. And that happens to be the University of Texas at Austin, right? So I moved to Austin. Um, if I were a Texas resident, I could save myself a lot of money. So I worked in the state of Texas for a year and became a Texas resident. And then I was able to go to the University of Texas as a Texan. My PhD cost me less than my undergraduate degree. Okay? So, hear me when I say it's about planning, right? And thinking about what it is that you want to do. So, I was joking with Margaret about this earlier today. Sally May and I are going to be married for a long time, and that's okay with me, right? Because those are the decisions I made for me, and the return on investment was significant. But I thought about how I was going to pursue each one of those degrees, including my undergraduate degree, because I went to school on a full academic scholarship because I have two sisters. And so I was thinking about my parents paying for them. So all along I've been thinking about and planning. So you can do everything you want to do. It's a matter of thinking about it and kind of planning it out. Okay. This is a topic that we all need to take pretty seriously. And it's credit cards. Credit cards are not bad. We just have to be careful in how we use them. And it is absolutely critical to know the rules of the game with credit cards, right? 
So to know the interest rate and the credit limit and what's going to happen to your balance if you're late paying the balance. What happens if you allow the fees to, I mean, your balance to grow very high and you have a high interest rate, how that starts to accumulate. So be very careful um, when selecting credit cards that you know the rules of the game. Um, as I just said, understanding the consequences of um, late payments. Um, thinking about the total cost of the items that you're purchasing. Um, there, most of the time, if I, don't, if I know I don't have the cash to pay my credit card bill for that particular item, I think twice about whether I need to buy that item, right? Because you don't want to buy something and then pay interest on it for the next year and a half, right? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and then pay off the balance each month if possible. That's not necessarily always going to be possible, but you really do want to pay as much of it as you can so that you just don't keep incurring um, interest expense. And the most important reason why that matters is you want to protect your credit. A lot of people aren't thinking about that when you first get out of college, especially if your, your salaries are very modest. But it takes so long to repair your credit if you mess your credit up. And you just you don't need that because you're going to want to buy cars, you're going to want to rent additional apartments, and your credit score is just going to follow you. So it's really about not biting off more than you can chew because that will impair your credit score. Um, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of companies um, do a credit check before you're hired. So in a lot of business companies, um, anybody who works for the business office has to have a credit check. We have to be sure that you're credit worthy before we would allow you to handle certain kinds of, certain amounts of money. Um, and it can also drive up your, in, your insurance rates. So it's really important to be thinking about your payment history as it relates to your credit score. Do you recommend like growing our credit score now? Because I know that like when my dad was talking to me about this, that you know you can put in like little bits just to get a credit card, just to kind of keep like practicing this kind of phenomenon, but also it can help you. you know, it can be pay, pay a, it back, you can start a good it credit now. score is always a good thing mm -hmm. um, because in some instances there are people who don't have credit. Mm -hmm. They've never had a credit card. They've never had accounts in their own name. Mm -hmm. And so I mean, we have a friend in Annapolis who's ready to buy a house. And I just don't know how you do this. I mean, she's in her late 40s, and she has no credit history, right? So she can't qualify to buy a house because nobody, she doesn't have a history on how she handles her financial responsibilities. So the mortgage company made her get a credit card. They made her get um, a cell phone account in her name and several things just so they can track her history. So if you're in a position that you can do that, it's always good to work on positive credit. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know why it says please wait, please wait up there. It doesn't go right here. But anyway, um, what method should you use? Just use what works for you. There are certainly products, software products out there like QuickBooks that are very user friendly and that you can put your finances in and it will spit out a lot of information, a lot of reports. You can also use spreadsheets if you like to do that. I had a friend who would put buckets of money in different bank accounts, like his emergency fund or his vacation fund. That would help him to be disciplined, no, I'm not going to touch that money, except in a dire emergency. Um, so you need to figure out what works for you to help you keep on track. Let me say one thing about that. Um, I use a spreadsheet for my personal expenses. Um, in the back of the room is my partner, Cynthia. Okay. Um, when we moved to Maryland, we had lived in separate places. She lived in Houston, I lived in Austin. And she did whatever she did with her money until she moved to Annapolis with me. Right? When she moved in with me, I have a spreadsheet for everything that Bronte Jones does. And she looked at the spreadsheet and she said, hell no, I am not going to track my expenses by a spreadsheet. And I said, if it's commingled with my resources, you will live by this spreadsheet. Okay? And so, I mean, and when I tell you it calculates, it has everything, right? And don't you know, at this point in time, almost 10 years later, every month, can I see the spreadsheet? What's in the spreadsheet, right? Because she's learned to live by the spreadsheet. And the best part about it is, at the end of the year, we can actually track what we spent on X, Y, and Z. And so it's really good just to know what your spending patterns are, right? And we build in vacations, or we know. Right? The holidays are coming, so we typically spend this amount on holiday gifts. So I put it in the spreadsheet, right? And it really has become a very disciplined way to live. And somebody in this room 
now appreciate that expression. I will not say who that is. All right. Banking. You really, again, want to look at the options that banks give you. If you want to try and get interest on your money, try and get a checking account that has a uh, that bears interest or there's uh, sweep accounts that your money is moving back and forth so you are getting interest. However, you have to make sure your money is liquid enough for you to get it. Don't tie it up. Don't let them sell you a CD and you put your money in there and then you have nothing for an emergency. Um, so you need to look at those options carefully, ask a lot of questions and, and figure out what's going to work best for you to get the most return. And then once you get some more money and can start investing, then you can look at other options of, of tying your money up for longer periods of time. I'm glad you mentioned that your father's been talking to you. Ask advice. Your, your family, when you're talking to your employer, ask all the questions you can about those health plans and the other benefits. There's professionals out there that you can go to for help with budgeting if you need to do that route. Then and we just say be disciplined but flexible enough. And just like Bronte said, she made a deal on how to get her doctorate. You can do things like that. I actually lived in my garage for about six months while we built our house. Because our other house sold a lot faster. You do what you can, but it was worth it in the end. You do what, you know, you can be flexible. But you also need to be disciplined. Yes, ma'am. Can you go more into detail about what you mean when you say maintain the liquidity? There's um, instruments that you can put your money in. Right. Like a checking account, your money's very liquid. You can get it right away. If you would put it in a certificate of deposit for six months okay. or something, your money's tied up. You could withdraw, but there's a huge penalty. Okay. There's certificates of deposits like for five, ten years. Would you want to tie up your money that long to get a higher interest rate? So you really shouldn't be looking at tying up your money until you kind of build a little bit of money that you won't have to get out right away. Um, and again, we just uh, want to reiterate that you need to have a plan goals, know what your goals are, and then get, use your budget as a plan to get there. Does anybody have any questions about any specifics? Or? I don't know that this, and I actually don't know if this is what I mean, but um, it has to do with Obamacare, of course. Um, so isn't it true that right now, in, in, in terms of Obamacare, we have in cover 26 that were covered under our parents' insurance? And I have no idea what they've like decided. This is Rebecca. Rebecca I don't know what they decided with the whole, their, whatever, the politics behind it. But if that's the case, let's just pretend like and hope that that's the case. Right. Um, I mean, sh I mean, should we think? I mean, obviously, we should always be thinking about like, what the next step is for us. But I mean, I don't know like, because we don't know how certain it is. And so, moving forward, how? Should, I mean, I just don't really know. Is that something that we should kind of bet on or not? Or is that? Well, there, there are two answers to that. Right. right? Um, you can be covered until you're 26. Mm -hmm. But you have to think about what the cost is to your parents to continue to cover you versus what the cost might be for your employer. Okay. Right? Um, I think the rates here, I think I paid 50 bucks a pay period here, right? Um, for health insurance, or 100 bucks a month, right? But if I were still care, pretend I was 25, okay. <laughs> it might cost my mother far more than 100 bucks to cover me for health insurance. So I wouldn't look at it as, I can be carried by my parents, so I'm going to stay on my parents' plan. Right. Because most companies are charging parents kind of a premium mm -hmm. to carry dependents and spouses. Okay. So it's typically going to be cheaper for you to cover yourself than it is for your parents or your spouse even to cover you. So It is a really good part of the Affordable Care Act because I'll tell you, when my daughter graduated from college in May, I got a call at the end of the May, she's coming off your health insurance. And we had to scramble and just find, she didn't have a permanent job yet, you know, just some short-term insurance for her. So it really is a good thing to allow younger people to get started. Right. They can stay on until 26. It's a really good thing. I know this wasn't the most exciting stuff, but do you have other questions? Yes. How uh, should we start looking about long-term investments for ourselves for retirement? Well, most of your company, are you talking about through work or on your own? Just on our own, because it is an option. No, it, it is an option. 
Um, I mean, there are um, financial advisors that um, are available to you. Um, I would say um, make sure that you've got the other bases covered first. But reaching out to a financial advisor early is a good idea. Um, that's something I started doing early. That's because, I mean, that's, that was my area and that was of interest to me. But you can begin that as soon as, as possible. And I know there are financial advisors right down here that you can reach out to. What are some tax benefits um, for putting money in IRAs but if you're below certain um, income thresholds and stuff and you can maximize that for tax benefits as well? Yeah, I have a situation that's probably a little unique to this room uh, and I'm going to throw it out that you can kind of respond to the angle, but Let's just say that I graduate from Dickinson and I want to start a venture. Um, so I want to combine, you know, private investment with personal savings, and then maybe um, use a portion of my credit to start this venture. Yeah. How then should I personally be planning around that? Because you know, number one, obviously, it's it's high risk, so there may not be the return that you're expecting. You know, what what sort of uh, kind of institutions could we be looking at right now that would be you know helpful? What kind of venture would you be thinking about? I mean, about? so I'll just say, like, if I wanted to start a coffee shop, if I want, and not that I actually want to, not that we actually want to do that, but if that, if that were the case, that, that we wanted to do something like that, um, you know, where there isn't this, um, you know, this, the overhead that provides things like healthcare, um, you know, what types of things should we be considering in, in that kind of situation? Well, you would need to be having conversations with other entrepreneurs who, who are effectively planning for that. Because I actually know a lot of independent, um, I know people who are in the hair industry, for example. They make a wonderful living, but they're not taking um, their retirement very seriously. And I'm very concerned, right? So while they've got health care covered, because there are options for individuals to do that, they're not taking very seriously kind of planning for retirement and other things. So I would actually seek out um, some entrepreneurs who are actively doing those things, right? Um, because there are a lot of individuals and companies that take that very seriously. There are also groups that come together to form consortia mm -hmm. to um, kind of build a partnership to pursue um, investment options. Uh, so, I mean, we can identify entrepreneurs in, in the area, and I would start interviewing people to understand how they're, how they're meeting those needs. Because it's one thing when your employer is doing it for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of, it becomes a no-brainer. Right. But it really does take a certain amount of discipline when you're doing it for yourself. And there, there are individuals who don't want to take it out of their profit without understanding that failure to do so could really compromise how they live in their golden years. So. Another thing you have to consider is to get legal advice about how you want to set up. There's, you know, sole proprietorship. That has a lot of risk. If you went under your house and all your personal property, but if you set up like a limited liability corporation or a partnership, yeah. there's more protections for your personal goods versus the company goods. Mm -hmm. So that would be something you'd want to look into. Make sure you're set up the right way. And the beauty is there are a lot of individuals or small corporations that have set up coffee shops. So I would reach out. To, I mean, since you've said that's what you're interested in. I'd reach out to them and have conversations with them. Right? But you can also start understanding which one of your friends will be your partners or give you seed money to get started. Already? <laughs> He's already done that? <laughs> I have not already done that. <laughs> After this conversation, you will be. Who's got a grand? And there's a QuickBooks Pro for small businesses, good yeah. software for small businesses. Um, well, I'm just wondering, like, I don't think this is going to happen, but um, if it were to, where I were to drive it from Dickinson and then end up working in a lab for, like, um, like postdoctorate stuff or um, just, like, right at the into grad school, I mean, a lot of times you're working for a stipend, and I don't believe that any of the, like, like insurance and all that stuff is covered. So, I mean, then would you look for your... Like you were saying, how you can bear, like kind of the basics. You know, yeah, but, it's just, but if you're doing a postdoc or you're in some sort of educational institution, then health insurance is always going to be an okay. option to you as a student. Okay. Right?
right? So you'll yeah. be covered, okay. right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they, the, higher ed expects students to be poor and understand that you might be sitting while you're poor, right? Yeah. So you'll be covered. Okay. Okay, again, this was not the most exciting stuff, but the bottom line really is you just have to know what you're working with and to operate within those means because I'm telling you, so many people screw themselves up right after college and aren't thinking about the consequences when you turn 30 and you're ready to get serious about life, but all those credit card bills that you did not take care of when you were in your early 20s or when you kind of blew off Sally Mae or some other things, those things have real consequences for you later, and it really does take a long time to repair your credit history once it's kind of been ruined. And so I've watched people pay um, interest rates on buying a car that, I mean, would just, I, mean, I just can't believe it. But I also um, know some of the stuff they did before that put them in that position. Um, and it's a beautiful thing when you've been responsible and you can go into the store and know whether it's a car, whether it's a house, that your credit is clean and you can transact any business that you want to train. I mean, that's a wonderful thing, but it requires kind of planning and being responsible in these initial years when you first leave college. So just, just don't lose sight of that. Right? It really is so much more important to live within your means than to keep up with the Joneses, if you will. Right? So. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you.